combustion than you know, getting rid of um, um, you know, fossil fuel uh, combustion. Uh, because if you, if you do that, um, you are left with some pollutants um, at a climate level, but also at a local level, like tire and brake wear and so on. Um, uh, but um, uh, you reduce about 80% of the problem. Uh, and I think that zero air emissions is a very clear way of thinking about it, um, because um, uh, when people talk about net zero, um, you are really talking about or carbon neutral. You are talking about sort of, well, what do you mean by net? Or what do you mean by neutral? And then you get into accounting rules. Whereas if we're talking about zero air emissions, um, it's actually clear what you mean. Uh, I think, uh, as I've said, um, political leadership, technology and lifestyle change all have their parts to play. Uh, and what I'd like to explain, I think we all know what technology means, um, but what I'd like to explain um, by way of lifestyle change is that um, you know, I'm not telling, this is not about sort of telling people that they have to change their culture or they can't go to, um, you know, um, uh, you know, football games or something like that. What it is talking about is a spectrum of measures which are not normally captured by, um, um, you know, programs which analyse solutions to air pollution. Um, uh, it really is, I think of it as a spectrum of five, you know, between five things. At one end, yes, you're banning some things, some really unforgivable, dangerous things that harm people very obviously. Um, but you can then introduce charges. Um, so you can charge people a bit more for doing polluting things. Uh, in the middle, um, you can run campaigns which tell people about the problem and ask for their help. Um, uh, and that can change um, behavior and lifestyles. Um, you can then move towards the other um, end of the spectrum with um, incentives, um, you know, payments um, for people doing good things. Uh, and then you would get adoptions, like uh, my example would be, you know, the wearing of seat belts, where in many countries um, uh, people wouldn't get into a, a car without putting on a seat belt. So, you know, when I talk about lifestyle changes or um, behavioural change, um, it's really this spectrum. Um, uh, these um, five tools um, all play a, a potential part um, and they don't rely on technology. Um, and, and that's not about telling people um, that they can't do things, um, but it is, uh, except in the most extreme cases, but it is actually sort of um, you know, talking about saying certain things we must ban, um, uh, some things we can charge, some things we can give you incentives for. Uh, and I think that's a much better way of um, thinking of uh, or assessing measures to tackle the problems. Uh, um, next slide, please. Uh, so I think there are some really tremendous opportunities. Um, it's very easy to, to think that um, tackling air quality um, uh, air pollution, tackling climate change, uh, is really a very difficult task, which it is difficult. Uh, but just think about what we achieve um, if we do uh, tackle these things, you know, as we did, for example, uh, in, in, in the UK in 1956 with the Clean Air Act, uh, the first Clean Air Act. Um, um, governments um, said they wouldn't have enough money, um, that the poor would freeze or die, the logistic industry wouldn't cope, but in fact, actually, um, um, moving towards um, um, you know, a low pollution um, environment uh, in those days, um, tackling the problems we knew about then, um, you know, really made um, uh, London and the UK a world leader for a few years uh, in environmental action. Um, we also, I, I would like to see um, a UN right um, to safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environments. Um, new clean air acts because um, you know which actually put these new air quality guidelines um, in, in law um, and of course a successful um, uh, COP26 and I'd just like to end finally with a, a final slide if I may my next slide please um, uh, I think India I'm very pleased and honored to be speaking um, uh, uh, to an Indian audience um, uh, um, uh, this afternoon, uh, your time, this morning, uh, my time, um, because 
um, you know, we are in this commonwealth of countries, um, and I think it, there's a great opportunity um, for the commonwealth countries uh, really to um, speak frankly about the issues and frankly about the solutions that are needed. Uh, and I really do encourage um, the Indians uh, to uh, um, I encourage all of you to, to press the de developed world um, for um, the thing um, that, that you uh, any skills um, uh, from some of the industries. Um, but India's got a, a contribution it can make um, towards this problem, um, uh, harmful emissions, whether it's from local air pollutants um, or green. Uh, at the moment, I don't know, but my guess at the moment, my assessment um, is that um, uh, COP26, um, the outcomes there will be good. Um, I think there's a real mood for, for achievement, uh, uh, achieving things. Um, my feeling is it won't be good enough um, to get us to that two degree level, but we need to get very, very close to it um, so that in a year or two's time, um, we are well on the way um, to getting to at least um, a, a maximum of, of two degrees. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, that's um, my presentation and I'd be very pleased to take questions. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Simon. Sir, I have one one query. Okay. Uh, yeah, any similarities between uh, COETA protocol and uh, COP26, sir? Uh, could you repeat that, please, slowly? Any any similarities between COITO protocol and the COP26? Um, uh, yes. So um, the the Kyoto um, uh, you know protocol um, you know was set um, I think it was 1990, um, so you know, a very long time ago, um, uh, and it was about um, uh, emission reductions. Uh, but I think um, uh, and it had some very powerful. Um, um, sort of targets in place, uh, but the science, I think, moved on or has moved on really quite a lot um, uh, by 2015 uh, by Paris, uh, and I think we've now got some much more specific, much more holistic um, uh, issues on the table. Those sort of points I, I raised about, you know, the UK's four goals. Um, I think we now know really. It's not just about sort of headline emission reductions, which is really, I think, the heart of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, now we need to be talking about emission reductions. I would, I would say that Kyoto Protocol was a fantastic step, and um, it's certainly done um, much for us. But the Paris Agreement, I think, is much more comprehensive. Um, uh, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Bojan, do you have any other question? No, ma'am. Okay. Is there anything else in the chat box? No, ma'am. No more queries, okay. ma'am. Yes. Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Simon, for sparing your valuable time amidst your busy schedule. Uh, we understand uh, the amount of uh, effort that you have taken to be with us in preparing and presenting your uh, topic today. So thank you so much. Over to Bojit. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much to all of you. It's very kind of you to invite me. Thank you. Thank you. Bojit? Yes, yes ma'am. So now I extend my heartfelt thanks to Mr. Simon for his wonderful and useful information about the key issues for a successful COP26. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, ma'am. So my heartfelt gratitude to Mr. Simon Briquet and my sincere thanks to Dr. Borjan for moderating the session. The next session will be moderated by Dr. Sendabar Selvi. Ma'am, kindly take over the session. Good afternoon, all.
Ma'am, I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm yes, audible. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. You're audible. Good afternoon, all. Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon, all. I am happy to welcome you all to the seventh session of International Virtual Conference on Transdisciplinary Research and Innovation for Entrepreneurship and Sustainability. Now, I welcome Ms. Asma Bobri, Faculty, Department of Library and Information Science. Service as professor in information science in Casablanca, Morocco, and MA in cultural anthropology in Budapest, Hungary, and PhD in library and information science at ALT University, Budapest, Hungary. She is currently doing research in user education in developing countries on how to develop knowledge. She is more transparent. I thank you, madam for accepting our invitation and delivering lecture. Once again, I welcome you, ma'am. I hope the participants will cherish and learn from this session. Once again, I welcome you all. Now, I invite Dr. Asma. Madam, session is hello. yours. Uh, hello. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, Welcome, Asma. Asma. Welcome to this session. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me today for this uh, presentation Hello, conference. Yes, and uh, uh, yes, so let's maybe get started um, since the introduction was uh, a summary. <laughs> Thank you again. And um, can you please share the, uh, the PPT? Emima, is Darmi there to share the PPT? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. She's sharing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just a moment. Of course. Can you see the presentation, ma'am? Yes, yeah. we can. Thank you so much. Uh, so today I will be presenting uh, knowledge organization, the meaning of knowledge organization and uh, how it is uh, uh, related to sustainable development and uh, its cultural frames. Also, uh, I will speak about uh, its uh, multidisciplinarity. So uh, in the next slide, please, uh, uh, there is an outline. Uh, 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 as I said, we will speak about knowledge organization, the reasons for uh, knowledge organization, uh, the systems used for uh, organizing knowledge, and also we will tackle sustainability and the relation between sustainability, knowledge organization, and the frame and the cultural frame. So in the next slide, please, uh, the definition of knowledge organization. So there is a, no a narrow uh, definition and a wider definition. First, what is knowledge organization uh, is uh, to some extent, of course, difficult to uh, contain. And uh, but from a simplistic uh, uh, simplistic definition. It's the process of creating, utilizing, sharing, storing, and managing information and knowledge. And uh, it can be defined also as information organization, and it's considered as uh, the science dedicated also to order knowledge and uh, to elaborate uh, the elaboration of uh, knowledge organization is also related to the evolution uh, of science in the Renaissance period. And uh, in purpose, in the purpose was to make the discoveries less ambiguous. And uh, an evolution of knowledge organization in the 17th century um, took place uh, at that period. And, and 
this was in order to organize knowledge based on a universal language system, such as uh, the universal decimal classification or the D-way decimal classification. And uh, these are mostly known in the library and the information science. And it's, uh, and of course, this uh, so this uh, the and uh, the uh, my knowledge uh, started at that period uh, that to make the that's ambiguous. So um, K, uh, KO or knowledge organization is the field of research and study concerned with organizing classifying knowledge to make it accessible to different entities. And there is also, as I said, the neural definition that is known uh, as the activities such as documenting, describing, and uh, indexing, classifying, um, which are performed in libraries and uh, uh, libraries, bibliographic databases, archives, and other kinds of uh, memory institutions by librarians, archivists, or uh, information scientists, also uh, by um, uh, computer algorithms and the uh, layman. So in the next slide, please, uh, there is the broader uh, meaning, which is about uh, the social division of mental labor and education, and the structure of disciplines and professions, uh, the social organization of media, the production and dissemination of knowledge. So the broader sense is about uh, how knowledge is socially organized and how reality is organized. And um, I would add also um, from another, so the wider meaning uh, of knowledge actually is thus uh, the relation of how knowledge is perceived uh, in the first place and how it is interpreted in the real world. And uh, of course, this raises uh, questions uh, and queries in relation to the way used in to organize and loan knowledge. And there is also, and of course, it, there is uh, reliability in the system used, or if it is uh, if it is accurate uh, as uh, for controlled vocabulary employed within the field of knowledge organization. So, as I said, uh, the definition uh, of knowledge organization in business uh, um, uh, field or in uh, economic field, uh, it is known as knowledge management as well. And uh, it is also the process of creating, utilizing, sharing, storing, and managing knowledge information within in an organization or company to achieve its objective. So it employs different um, uh, interdisciplinary literature from business administration, information systems, uh, and management, uh, and also library and information science. So in the next slide, I will, uh, air, why do we uh, why do we need the knowledge organization? So we need knowledge organization to facilitate the retrieval of knowledge and uh, to re localize it. Uh, so for example, if a user of a, a person needs uh, an information, uh, he needs just to type uh, or to look for a keyword or uh, uh, any other uh, uh, code that, uh, that makes him... Uh, um, um, that makes him uh, find the information more, much more easier. So is to help, as I said, retrieving and localizing the seeked information by individuals or entities uh, to make the discoveries less ambiguous, as I said, uh, to avoid making institutional sustainability. To facilitate the decimal classification 